made it. Hi, my name's Brandy. This is Just Waking Up. Welcome aboard. Today, I had the most dynamic conversation with Tony Rodriguez, the author of Series Colony Cavalier. I recently read his book and put out my first of many visual book reports. It's my role to bring you authentic resources and information about off-world existence. Because here we go, guys, it's on. So I hope you enjoy this amazing conversation that I had with this incredible human being. And I hope you have the most amazing and blessed day. Thank you for watching. Hi, Tony. Hi, Brandy. Thanks for having me. It's good to be Thank here. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be able to talk to you about your book and you. Thank you so much for coming in and being with us today. It's a pleasure. Um, there was a time I did many, many, many interviews about the book. And it's like it's been digested by most of the audience that's into this sort of thing. And it's still fine. I'm still finding new audiences, but instead of, you know, every week, it's like every once a month, it's like I break into new, new audiences. So um, I'm just happy to be here and talk about it at all. Like happy to have the book out and, and finished behind me and um, happy that anybody ever read it. So thanks for having me. Thank you. So I'm thinking and hoping that much of my audience is new to your story and it, many of the, these ideas are they've probably never heard of and just the idea that for one a human being was taken off of this planet and then that you went to multiple places off of this earth how does that even start where did that start so, yeah it's a it's a mouthful it's definitely a handful a for mouthful. anybody that, yeah anybody that's never that's unaware of the technology, the, you know, I want to call it a subcode, the genre of a secret space program that the militaries at the, in World War II got access to space and anti-grav technology and that other militaries after World War II, including the United States, got access to the technology and went into space only to find out that it's somewhat hostile. And so they kept it a big secret. And we have infrastructure in the solar system and beyond to nearby stars and actually quite far in space, human colonies all through Mars, Ceres, around Jupiter, uh, you name it. And many other species, thousands of species interact with us and come through our solar system. So boom, like right when you say that, just, just in that little synopsis, it's um, very hard for the average person that's been programmed to, to laugh at these things through the media that they've been exposed to their whole life it's very hard for somebody like that to take it seriously but the reality is in my book and even afterwards after the book was out i've drummed up a ton of evidence and there are a lot of things that i know that i shouldn't that i can't know so something uh is worth talking about with when we're talking about my account what happened to me the names places and dates and the people and the programs and money that moved around it are all i've found all to be accurate, to be true. And um, so that's why I think that's why the book got so far, you know, it was bestseller for six, first six weeks and did really good. And uh, it's still out there going, you know, it's been going on two years now uh, since I wrote it, uh, since we released it. So um, my account is one that has a, a, a great deal of trauma. And I would say this to anybody that's never heard of me or never heard of my book, it's traumatic. It's very traumatic. A lot of people couldn't finish it, especially the first part. I was a young child when I was taken and I was abused greatly um, through those years and then sold off into the secret space program and eventually worked on UFOs and uh, first as maintenance and then as um, cargo engineering for a corporation that was in the series uh, asteroid Series Dwarf Planet near the asteroid belt, uh, Series Colony Corporation. And we did, I worked on a ship trading with extraterrestrials all through the galaxy. It was very routine and um, not a fantastic life compared when you're living it. Like the same way that our lives are fantastic compared to somebody from the 1800s. Right. You know, they would be, they would be shocked. And, but we don't think any twice about our microwave or our cable TV or the internet and our, our phone. 
Um, these are all amazing, magical, unbelievable technologies to people back then. And living on the series Colony Corp was the same way that it is now. You just take it for granted. It wasn't impressive. It's not impressive when you're living there. So um, sadly enough, we're not at the top of the food chain of technology, nor um, many other things that we think we are way developed at here on the surface of the globe, of the earth. So um, that's kind of what my book is. I don't know if I'm going off in a different direction from what no, you said. That Rian. was great. That was great. That um, May I ask you a True. couple of questions in regards to that? Absolutely. Please there do. was a lot. And um, I'm really curious. Can you tell us a little bit about, you mentioned Series Colony Corp Corporation? Yes. So can you elaborate? Can we start... Um, can we talk a little bit about the organizations or corporations that you remember experiencing and hearing about that were part of that were part of your story? For instance, on Earth, do you know what type of organizations that were involved in this in taking you? I know this is a very elusive question, and I know the answer, and I know it has an elusivity to it. If that's even a word. Well, so it I'm seems kind to of be, challenging you with this story. I know, or this. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Okay. So okay. So it's turning into that. Let's go. Uh -huh. um, in the beginning, uh, they, it was private. There was a private person. There was a citizens that I went to school with. A kid. He said his dad was an Illuminati. He said my dad's an Illuminati. What's your dad do? We were in an advanced learning class on Wednesdays, the talented and gifted program. And his dad came in in April and was the judge to the science fair right after Easter. And he pointed me out to him and said, Dad, that's that boy I told you about because I'd picked on him. I'd been jealous of him for being very smart. And so I tried to find another way around be outsmarting him by being um, cruel. And uh, so he pointed me out to his dad. This was on a Wednesday morning and on Thursday afternoon. I believe it was April 15th, um, 1982, that I was taken. And I had, I had ETs. Uh, something flew over the house with bright lights shining down, spotlights, and uh, strange events, and then a gray ET and several smaller reptilian ETs in my bedroom paralyzed me and picked me up and carried me to the flash of light at the end of my bed, and I woke up um, abducted. So I'm getting away from the question, I believe. No, I think you are answering it spot on because your Earth experience was actually not some like militant organization it was probably nefarious it was initiated by nefarious earth groups which so these were guys that were working high up in the corporate structure so these were corporations that have access to space-based corporations and when i was taken uh so long story short i went through a process and then i woke up with no memories of who i was and i began a 20-year tour where i was a piece of equipment traded from one pro black project to another and eventually into the infrastructure in the solar system, into the space program. And so, I woke up in Eastern California, and I just want to say that that particular, I found the remnants of the funding for that, and it seems to be a subcontractor that was paying Army INSCOM that was researching with Stanford Research Institute at the time, Project Grill Flame, and it was remote viewing research. And so they wanted to do as far as they could. So they thought we were clones. They called me a clone at the time, and uh, they had a dozen or so kids like me with 10-year-old kids, and they put us through rigorous trauma-based mind control drugs and programmed us to believe that to be malleable and do whatever we were told. And then they put us through remote viewing exercises and out-of-body exercises and eventually what was called psychoenergetics. And so after that, I was shipped off to Peru and I was field operational uh, remote viewer. Uh, they were drug, they would give me a drug and I would go near to death and they would ask me questions and I would give the answers. And they were stock, shocked. The people, I went to a place called uh, Porto Tehuantinsuyo, Peru, which is now called Boca, Colorado, Peru. They renamed the city. Um, so that was the CIA. So we were, we, at that time when I was doing that in Peru, we were shipping cocaine from that area, Co Busco, the the cocaine paste, we were shipping it from there to Santa Marta, Colombia on a, on a um, cargo plane and um, a C-46 cargo plane, a C-46 commando. I remember it well and crawled all over that thing and turned out that was one of the things I remembered. 
And just uh, about a year and a half ago, I found the plane. It's parked in Pucallpa, and it was seized by the narcos and the war on drugs in 1990 from the nearby town of Porto Maldonado, where it was where they had it parked. So it's exactly how I remembered it years after I remembered it. Um, so that was seemed to be the cocaine import agency. So it seemed to be I was a technology. We were taken through this. I, you know, somebody in the corporate structure said, take that kid, take these kids. A bunch of kids from my school went. The ETs came down and got us in a weekend and spawned spawned our consciousness into clones and then set us away for our programs. And I ended up in this program, a, a remnant, a, a sub program of Project Grow Flame or the leftover funds of Project Grow Flame. And then um, into Peru for a couple of years. And when I lost that ability or I became less good at less at it, they shipped me back to Seattle to my owner was a billionaire. It's no, not Bill Gates, but was a billionaire. Um industrial person in seattle he was a practicing satanist i witnessed satanic rituals at his home and i lived there for two years and we were being used for sex slaves for parties for um political parties and other things and military groups would fraternities would come by and take us boys there was another house on the property with girls in it i believe um and then when I lost my use at that, when I became uh, not useful, then they said they'd sell me off to the military. That was the exact word. It's, we're going to sell you to the military. And when I was sold to the military, they gave me a shot. I was drugged and put unconscious, and two guys in a van took me. And I woke up on a spacecraft heading towards the back of the moon. So for the second time in that 20 years. So I was put into the infrastructure of the secret space program at that time. And this would have been... Uh, in 87, right around 87, 1987 ish, 88 summer, um, coming into the springtime of 87, I think, you know, it's been a while since I looked at, made my time, went over my timeline. I think timeline work is the best way to recover memories. Um, and so that's, that's where I went. I have some notes yeah. here for you. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you have the timeline there. You've been doing your homework. Wow. And then it's your book. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so uh, yeah, the book was it's two years ago since I've done that. I've moved on. I'm working on this. my second book, Project Star Maker, is like a small companion to the book, and very wooish, or not woo. I hate I hate branding things, but it's it's the more spiritual side of what happened, and like a whole different thing that it was very hard to explain. So I just never did. So I Jackie Kenner twisted my arm, and we put out Project Star Maker, I and I'm working on my by the way. third and fourth books now. Still, thank you. Yes. And I can't wait to read your, oh, so there are going to be two books, three and four. Well, so the book I'm working on now is not part of that trilogy. So mm -hmm. it's it's based on what I've done since and the things that I've learned and remote viewing. So being in that program, Grill Flame, brought me, brought me a huge interest to remote viewing. On, I didn't even realize it until I went to Annual Kern last year and dredged up all the memories of the program. Um, but I started a group, a remote influencing group on my Patreon, and then it spawned into a remote viewing group and they're successful. They really, they really do good. They're a lot of fun and it's a great bunch of people. Um, I'm trying to make it to where I can accommodate more people because it's growing slowly and I want to make it to where I can, you know, more of a school setting than just sit around and talk in a Zoom call. Um but yeah, I went into that and I've learned a lot since then and recovered memories of the advanced things that they were trying on us kids in that program. So I, I actually physically went to the place in California in Inyo Kern, the very first place I woke up in the book, like after they did the surgery on me and said they would borrow my consciousness. And I stood in the same exact spot and it was absolutely surreal because for eight years I had had the memories of it and described it to people privately. And I took Tyler from uh, Tyler Koala from Journey to Truth podcast. We went out there together and he filmed it. And uh, it was exactly how I remembered it. And there were places that you could, that we discovered in at the on site that were uh, not visible from Google Earth and from other things. So we went there and I went, oh, God, there's the other building. And so all the buildings were accounted for the way that I remembered it. And the buildings that stand there now where I remember um, are classified as California special districts still. So there's a great deal of like, you know, circumstantial and supporting evidence. Like how could I remember that place as best I could? I've described it. I've been describing it for years and it's provable that I never went there physically because I've always had a lineage of people living with me and things. And uh, so then to go there and know my way around intimately uh, is a huge supporting evidence for my testimony.
So where can people find your that video? May I put a link to that video here? Is it on? Absolutely, absolutely. So it? the video, I have it on my YouTube, and it's on. Okay. It's actually it's public. I've made it a public video. Yeah. And it's been shared. So Tyler and I kind of went there, and then we went back and filmed a follow up. And I had some Google Earth stuff, you know, pictures of it. And we Tyler's a witness to everything. So we had a great, like an hour discussion of a video. I'll, I'll get you the link, Brandy. A lot of supporting evidence. And I think that a lot of people have seen. So I came out uh, in 2016. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people since then have seen my testimony and had, there's a real effect for people that um, were involved in the programs that have vague memories. And then they watch someone like me or somebody else. Not, it's not just me. Uh, I'm not the only one. And they see something, they go, oh, my God, I remember something like that, too. And it jogs their memory. And so that then they remember more, and then they come out with their story, and then the supporting evidence is there. Um, it, it was the same for me in the beginning. I heard other testimonies, and it jogged my memory. And um, so, I mean, that's just it. That's just, and it's be like that with anything. Anybody that was, you know, if, 10, if 30 people witnessed a crime scene, and then, and then five years later, 20 years later, they were asked to recount it. When they heard other testimonies, they go, oh, that's right. I forgot all about that. There was a fire extinguisher there, too. You know, like you would remember, start to remember other details off of each other. And that's the same thing that goes on in the community of whistleblowers around the space program. So a lot of the information has been released already. And it's also very hard for new people to bring new stuff uh, to prove their testimony. So I was very lucky to be in the early days of the secret space program, you know, uh, disclosure, disclosing and be a witnesses because some of the things that I said, I was the first one to say, and then it turned out that others could back it up. There was overlap. So specifically the submarines um, in that had been converted into zero grab spaceships. Uh, the other thing, uh, and then, you know, back then the Dawn probe in 2016 went to series and we had pictures and NASA had early, early um, findings that the O'Connor crater was a mix of, a bunch of minerals. And I said, no, no, that's salt. I remember flying over it. It was salt. And then in 2020, they came out, they were conclusive and they said it's briny salt. So I was confirmed there. So little stuff like that. Or I'm just fortunate of the timing. So they, the Dawn probe was in high orbit and they couldn't get a real good spectral analysis. It had to go into a lower orbit and then it ran out. And then when they got the data, it took them years to go through all the data and be conclusive. So it was 2016. They came out and said it was sulfur and a mix of like Sulfur and other, I forget the the cocktail of of elements. And um, a researcher I was working with that I went on that I went on the record in 2015 saying that those were or 2016 saying that those were salt deposits. I said that's salt. I remember there's little magnesium and there's salt in there. And uh, he said, "Do you want to retract your statement?" Because NASA says that it's not salt. And I said, absolutely not. If there's one thing I remember, it's flying over that geyser. It's a geyser. That's what water goes up and the water evaporates and the salt snows back down. And we went by and watched it one day. And that's something I, I was like, absolutely not. I will never, I don't care what NASA says. I know that's salt there because we had a conversation about it. It was a big deal to us living on that planet. And uh, it wasn't, so that was 2016, end of 16, I believe. And then it was August of 2020, the same researcher I started getting phone calls and emails that morning. Like I was getting up, going to work, um, walking out to my truck with my coffee, groggy. And then my phone started going off and I, I got the emails and it said, um, you were right all along. And then the article, it's all, and I just, I was over the moon. I was so, you know, you get beat up telling this stuff, you know, you do. Um, and I'm not complaining about it. That's what I signed up for and talking about it's treated me good too. But I'm just saying, you just there's a constant barrage of friends, family, loved ones, and strangers, and internet trolls. There's a constant barrage of people that are want to be skeptical because their own life sucks. For what that's the only thing I could think of. Um, why else? If you don't believe something, you would just move on. Why right. would you stop and try to tear somebody down? If unless you're just trying to divert your own un unhappiness. So, I put through a lot. I was through the, through a lot of it. You know, like there was an F Tony Rodriguez YouTube channel, Fraud Rigs, they called me. Oh, and, really? uh, oh yeah, that went on for a while. Wow. And I got, he was giving me the same guy that put it out was giving me emails saying he's going to beat me up and find me and burn my house down. And like, oh my god, so, I would throw down for you, Tony. Right on. Thanks. I'll yeah. throw down for you, Randy. 
things. Um, but I say I'm not belly aching about it. But what I what I mean what I mean by that is that it made that one sliver of validation of concrete validation all the sweeter. So to say, you know what I mean? Like that whole day, I was just I didn't touch the ground. I was just on floating on air because I finally had something very tangible that I'd called out. So it's so difficult. There've been so many. The other thing is like, there's, uh, there's spying that goes on. So there's electronic spying. There's e my emails get read. Like it's obvious because there were times when I would say something and it would come out in another form or I'd be attacked for it. Like there's a lot of shady stuff around this. If you're a UFO whistleblower, they are way ahead of you. And they, you know, there's a way people, they will, they will take what you say and whip up a movie quick and copyright it and shut you up in that regard. So there's a lot of dirty stuff that goes on. That'll be kind of come out. I'm going to touch on all that stuff in the third of the trilogy, not the remote viewing book, but the following book. So yeah. the book I'm working on now that is due for release at the end of April is on remote viewing and psychoenergetic, basically my experience with remote viewing. Um, and I've had one title. I had one title picked. I'm throwing it away. I need to make a, I don't have a title for it right now because it's morphed into something way more than just remote viewing. Um, when you talk about the history of psychic phenomena and psychoenergetics is what they call it now. It's just a much bigger subject than just remote viewing. I need to put remote viewing in there so that it, for the search engines, right? But um, it's way more than that. It's very, it's the, the history of remote viewing is a very small part of the book. It's really a tell, a tell on a lot of technology. I can't um, I would assume that, book, that it incorporates like ancient uh, like visioning practices, foreseeing, scrying, and things like this, I would assume kind of fall into the same category as remote viewing in your research? Well, so yeah. So the earliest, there's 500 BC, there's a written account of an actual remote viewing from the Oracle of Delphi. So I posted something on that. Like that's the earliest one. And it was literally like a remote viewing session, but it was an Oracle. And um, there was a natural gas there that the, where the Oracles were that had a drug effect to them. So um, they were highly psychic and highly accurate. Um, but um, psychic phenomena has been recorded in human history, the entire entirety of recorded human history. Since we started recording things, they were doing entrails and rolling bones. They had medicine men, they had witch doctors, uh, on and on. And I covered, I kind of touched it in the book because where they stopped. Uh, so we're talking about the third book now. Or, yeah, the third book. The reality is that it wasn't until the nineteen the 1900s, 1920s, that when that science started challenging sci psychic phenomenon to say, okay, we'll prove it. And they were coming up with these tests that were challenging. So the subject, you know, matter. So the tests were skewed. And there's a lot of talk about that. It wasn't, and then... Basically, after Sigmund Freud said there's no, you know, Sigmund Freud was against it. It was J.B. Ryan mm -hmm. stuck up. J.B. Ryan was the one that stuck up to Freud, if I'm saying that right. Um, they were both ends of the spectrum. But uh, basically, he gave rise to um, parapsychology, and um, I think hypnosis came out of that. What are one your thoughts which, on... Uh, like a control, like whatever the controlling group was at that time, keeping this information from the masses. Do you think that there was like an intentional uh, uh, kind of like coveting of this ancient secret knowledge? So what I'm saying is before the 1930s, yeah, all the way back in the all of humanity before the 1930s, there was no criticism of psychic abilities none it was totally accepted oh until there was no criticism mm -hmm. so it was the freud years that all of a sudden science came out and said well you can't prove it it's got to go away and this was through the colleges who nowadays when we look at what they're teaching oh you know that there is much of a business institution a for-profit institution which is substance um which is susceptible to that behavior immoral behavior in order to make money for one and for two they're gatekeepers of information absolutely there are things there are military technologies across the board that get developed in the colleges and then 
the information gets buried and on it, it's unavailable to the coming generations because it's a military technology. There's this isn't up for debate. This is how it works. This is how the world works. And so, what was ha else was happening in the 1930s? World wars were going on. So they they were getting ready for there were world wars. So the colleges were 100 percent under the boot of the militaries. And if they came out with this technology, like they could psychically see where the art, when the army is going to show up on your beach, you can see why they would want to get rid of that. And that was what happened. So prior to that psychic phenomenon was 100% accepted and was a, was in society. There was, it was a societal norm. Uh, you know, the witch doctor, grandma, rolling <laughs> dice, rolling bones. Uh, see, like you said, scrying, all, all of it, the crystal ball, everything like that. It was all accepted and it didn't get what it gets nowadays. And it all started then. And then later on in the 70s, I have paperwork where they were organized. There were organized groups that were sent around to colleges to protest and cause trouble for the non-elective classes that were teaching ufology, parapsychology and psychic phenomenon on because they were being studied on college campuses. But in the 70s, a group came out of nowhere and protested the same way that we the, the same way that we see certain ideals being buried in colleges today that people say you can't say that you can't say this though this was in the 70s a group came and they buried parapsychology so i'm getting away from my first book and this is the this is the substance of this book that i'm working on um but it's That's also you have organized edu organized education has always been a tool to conform the masses always and I it's actually did thing. an entire senior project on organized education and how it has been used. I mean, since biblical times, education in an organized way, in an institutionalized way, is always a tool of conformity. Always. And or to create worker bees and or to create a particular kind of mentality. Journey to Truth had a woman on their show that had information, I want to go back, that all textbooks, all textbooks throughout the world go through one organization of checks and balances. There's one organization that approves all textbooks in all of the world at every single institution. And so that just clicked in my brain. Like we're really, um, the, the those institutions are most definitely controlled and regulated. And if, if that makes sense, I don't want to go into too much. It's, it'll, you know, there's so many different ways you can go, but yes, to what everything that you're saying, and I'm hearing what you're saying is that there was an actual push to eliminate these theories, these ideas, these truths and realities from the general public in an academic setting. Yeah. And specifically, Number one, the idea, and they stigmatized it, that it was ridiculous so that students, the people that would graduate and then hold academic power or hold power in their institutional power right. would laugh at it, for one, right. and reinforce and reinforce it. And for two, that all those non-elective classes that were researching parapsychology and ufology and psychic phenomena, these were, this was going on, they all got canceled. Rather than the school put up with trouble and the, the, poly, the political heat from it, they just canceled these classes. They were non-electives anyway. So UFOlogy is buried and parapsychology is buried and psychic phenomenon is buried out of academia done in the 70s. And I have the paperwork to show it. So that'll be in the next book. But it also explains a lot of what's going on. So the other thing is they had great interest in this because there's a secret space program operating right under our noses. They were there taking millions of people, cloning them and using them for slave labor for 20 years and returning their consciousness back to the moment they took them. Okay. And okay. How can you say that so fast, right? Yeah. Can we can we really just time out there, just right there for a second? Because as many uh, points that you've proven and shown and so on with your story, it's still so hard for the layman, if you will, to wrap their head around this idea of being cloned and the idea of consciousness, memory wipes. Can you either give us like a reference to study this technology more and to can you elaborate on what that means? Like when someone takes someone's consciousness or 
to clone a human being and then to be able to to have something like that happen and not even know that it did. Um, I'm not challenging you by any means. Please know that I'm not challenging. I'm only asking, can you help to us to understand how something like that can happen? And what is that how technology? It's how it's possible and how I would know. Correct. So as you can imagine, it's very guarded. The yeah. This is something this when it so when you look at my testimony of California and Seattle and the facts, uh, how I called out the things on series, you know, I always said that if my memories, I went to the places in Seattle, it's exactly how I remembered it. I went to the places in, in California, it's exactly how I remember it. So I always tell myself, uh, I say that if my earthbound memories are accurate, then I have to assume that my space memories that I can't go to and visit and, and prove are accurate as well. So that's off my memory. So what I was taken, I was in the presence of extraterrestrials and then they operated on me and I woke up and lived two lives in the same, I lived the eighties twice. And it was like, I lived the first one first and then they put me back somehow. And I woke up the next morning in my bed in 1982 and I felt older and I felt like I'd been gone for 20 years, but I had no memory of it. And I had my memories back. So it was as if I was cloned and lived those 20 years first and then put back somehow. So that's the experience of it. The technology behind it obviously is guarded because they the very first thing they did when they invented clo when they cloned that sheep, it was lightning. It was within six days they made human cloning illegal so that you're not going to discover that technology or how the consciousness works. The human consciousness is much different than an animal's consciousness. I mean, we're made of the same stuff, but we work differently. Um, however... Since I've gone public, I've been contacted by a few thousand people that have said they saw my interview and they remember doing something, living through something the exact same. And unbeknownst to them, when I ask them a set of questions, I start to see patterns form. You start to see overlap in people's testimonies that this happened, I was this old, and then this happened, and then this happened. And I go, wait a minute, what happened here? And I, you know, when I add 20 years, like, you can take common denominators and forecast the next thing the person's going to say. And, you know, and I sit with an hour or two talking to these people and they tell you the same thing. They have no contact with each other. They have no context, no idea, but the same patterns emerge all the time. And it's, it's led me to conclude that they don't take your consciousness completely, that they dilute it. So it's as if your consciousness is a five gallon bucket of water <clears> and they clone you. <throat> and put two and a half gallons in the clone and two and a half gallons in you. And both of you are kind of lesser mentally for the duration of the lifetime. And they stop it at 20 years. It's capped at 20 years. For instance, I was taken in April of 1982. Um, I got to explain this, that the, the ship I was on did temporal. We, did, we went back in time every day. We'd leave at the same. We'd leave at eight in the morning. We'd come back at eight in the morning every day. So there was eight series. hours. Yeah, while I was working on series, right? So for a de better part of a decade, that was my job, five, six days a week. And so we did time travel. And so it wasn't a 20-year span here on Earth that I was gone. So what I'm saying is I was taken in 82, and it was right around 2000 that I snapped out of it. And everybody that I talk to, when they have a credible intake event, they have credible memories, and they overlap details that nobody else knows about, and there's no way that they could have known, Um that leads me to believe that they're genuine. They always have something at the 20 year mark. And I go, okay, so when do you think you were taken? And we talk about their early years and I go, okay, so that was 1990. And then I immediately add 20 years to it and go, what happened in 2010? And it's the same thing across the board. It's the same thing that I experienced. You know, I was a messy dropout and didn't have my life together. And at that 20 year mark, I woke up one day and I kept saying, it's over, it's over. I had this remarkable feeling and I cleaned my room and I needed to get rid of my car. You know what I mean? Like I, my life completely changed and I started taking, I couldn't have a relationships. I would, I, I was just an emotional wreck in all my relationships. I was a two week dating guy and I wasn't desirable. After that time happened, it was within six months. I met my wife and I was with her for 23 years. So I emotionally was fixed over overnight. And, um, it's the same thing in the other people that I talk to. So like I said, it's as if they dilute your consciousness and both of you for that 20 year period are mentally and emotionally less. In my case, I was very emotionally devastated and I'm very emotionally weak. 
And at the end of it, it I kind of snapped out of it and kind of got my life to began to get my life together. Although much later, you know, like I um, had stunted my own growth for living through those my twenties, basically being wasted, be basically being lost emotionally. So that's the same thing that I hear from other people. So if that's any, uh, if that's kind of a read into how the technology works, that's my best guess because that's definitely very valuable when you start to look at what labor costs. So just to have somebody to go around and sweep the streets on your, on your space planet, um, it costs money to pay somebody to do that costs resources. And so if you can take a clone and tell him he's a slave and not pay him anything with no, and then he's going to be gone exactly to 20 years on the day, on the day you put him back and there's no, there's no retirement. There's no, there's no medical insurance. There's nothing the labor of mankind is very, very, very valuable. And in fact, traded through the cosmos with other ETs. The argument that they would create robots that would do better than us is very false because um, we're very, we're, we're adaptable. Uh, we can be trained to do many things. We're programmable and we're extremely energy efficient. Everything you did, the electricity you used last year was less than a 500 or uh, I forget how many watts, but less than a hundred watt light bulb burns in 24 hours. So that was what how much electricity you, you used and me and everybody else watching in the entirety of a year. So we're very energy efficient. We're very programmable. We're very talented. And once more that a robot can't do, an AI can't do, is we have uh, the ability to change the quantum properties of the universe around us when we observe it. So in other words, we can manifest things. So, so we can manifest we can invent things and we can manifest things because we are made of the consciousness of the universe. Robots and AI are not, they cannot manifest. They are beholden 100% to the laws of the universe and humans are not. And so we're a very valuable working thing. If we have a task to do, we can manifest good luck to get the task done. Wow. That was very profound. What you just said, Tony. That was, I never Thank thought of that, like the concept of like biological and like human consciousness being able to manifest versus AI not being something that cannot, and it knows it and the advanced AIs know it. So that's what we are. So um, <clears throat> kind of going back to one of the things that you said, do you remember when they wiped your consciousness? Thank you for that. There was a lot of insights in what you just said, by the way. Um, regarding, and so I have two questions. Do you think then that uh, this technology is similar to that of like fracturing a consciousness? For instance, there's a lot of like, a lot of people coming out with <clears throat> somewhat paralleling your story, but very different. For instance, I've really been listening to a lot of SRA people coming out who are saying and discussing some of the things that they experience, um, very authentic testimonies. These aren't people who are trying to create content around their testimonies. It, it's just, it blew me away. Some of the things that I heard in your testimony and how similar it was to theirs. And there is a very clear, very specific technology to this trauma, if you will, in that it fractures one consciousness. Now, what I'm saying is a little bit different than what you were talking, but they seem like they're related. They seem similar. And so this like technology that is being used in these nefarious ways is similar to the technology that is implemented. I'm not sure. What are your thoughts? Is this kind of similar because what I've heard is that these dark arts actually were taken over by organizations such as the CIA, that the remote viewing techniques and the things that they're doing, they're going about it from this standpoint of, I think is just improper. I think that our gifts and our abilities and our sights and our, our, it comes from our own natural expansion and not by an inverted imposition on our bodies and forcing us to be, be these amazing or these not amazing, but do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I, I think that, I think that it, 
we're being blocked to understand how precious and beautiful our own energy bodies are. And absolutely, you know, is, I, I know I'm a little all over the place, but I'm just seeing a similarity in the technology that is being used by the space programs, by off-world corporations, for whatever they're using these human beings for and human clones is the exact same technology that they're using here in these weird kind of like dark artsy organizations on earth. Well, um, to unpack everything about the CIA and their participation in these things, and even the elite, like there's a lot of information about um, the rituals, um, SRA. Mm -hmm. It was very convenient that in back, when, I think it was in the 80s when a lot of witnesses were saying that they were taken and being used by organizations like, um, I forget what it, what start where it all started, like babysitting. There was a babysitting place and they were being, people grew up and had memories of witnessing satanic rituals. Um, and there was a huge in investigation into it. It was a big thing. And then all of a sudden they had like SRA, um, like a uh, amnesia, like where all of a sudden a bunch of people came out and then they were proved that they were imagining it. So they just dropped the whole thing. Yeah. So they buried it under a bunch of faults. They buried the subject matter that was coming out to the public and was actually being investigated by genuine authorities. They buried it under a false premise that there's some kind of um, egregore around it or some kind of condition that causes people to imagine it or somebody sees it. And, um, but that, I don't believe in that. I don't believe that's the case at all. I just believe it was an excuse to bury the investigation because these people are very powerful. I think it's more of a technology than it is a religion. And I think it's an occult science from thousands, probably all of mankind. Like they figured out how to communicate with ent either entities on the other side or other intelligences elsewhere in the cosmos or elsewhere, even on the earth or inside the earth that are very smart and they could get information and, and gain uh, a leg up. So that's also a great reason to, to hide it all. So there were many things in that were globally practiced too, that were um, accepted in the world, like ritual human sacrifice isn't, specifically doesn't specifically uh, belong to the satanists so most of the cultures around the world were sacrificing people in a ritualistic way we know about the mayans but really the mississippi indians the pagans the irish the english uh you know all around the mediterranean cain and abel you know that abraham was supposed to sacrifice his son like ritual human sacrifice goes back it goes uh, across to malaysia the egyptians down to the bottom through africa um Micronesia, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, the Hawaiians, and uh, in South America. Uh, so there was there was ritual human sacrifice everywhere on the globe up until Christianity. So Christianity, they said, what are we going to do, Jesus, when you die? Do we eat you? And he said, absolutely not. You'll never do that again. You'll eat of my body and drink of my blood. It's the wine and bread. And everywhere Christianity went after that, it stamped out ritual human sacrifice. So there's a technology there may be a technology there that was hidden that the saint, Satanists of today, the elites are still doing a consciousness technology. I don't know if you've seen you think somebody. Die. To... I'm sorry. What's that? Keep going. Well, I, was, I was just going to say that, um, you know, if you, if you're a hunter and you kill an animal, there's, there's really like a vibe to it, but it's not a big deal. But when a person dies, it's like, there's a glitch in the matrix and you can feel it. People start to see their own ex relatives, the wind changes, the weather changes, like for a split moment, the person passes. Like when a when a human dies, there's a there's a real there's like a warp in reality for a minute, and a lot of people witnessed it. Um, so there's a technology there that's been exploited by killing people on time and with lining up with astrological events. Like I don't know, and I'm not speculating, and I sure as hell I'm not advocating it. Um, but what I'm saying is this is this is the aftermath of an ancient culture. And if they had a way to do this, to give them, give them advantage, to give them accurate knowledge of the future, they could easily acquire wealth and power and control the rest of us. And it seems to be the situation. It seems to be the situation we're all in right now. The elites are very immoral. And there, there's a lot of witnesses to them coming out doing horrible things. And there's a lot of evidence to the con to 
to support that they are doing carrying out ritual human sacrifice, pedophilia, and a lot of other ritualized acts, not just not just cr raw criminal un un you know undisciplined acts. They're very disciplined, and these are people that are very elite. Um, and they're all in the same kind of club. So it's it's a technology. It's based on consciousness when it trades a one medium to the next. I witnessed some of it, and that's why I believe it the way I do believe that it's a technology the way I do. It's not a religion. That's not how that's not God, uh, how it works. So um, and then there's false religions built up, propped up around it to hide it, just like the egregore around in the 80s around this SRA, how they made it go away. They didn't they didn't hide what they did. They buried it in false ones around it. Just like the UFO. So if you go show me a picture of a UFO on Google and put up images, there's 50,000 fake images. There's one real one. And you think, you know, where's the pictures? Well, there's buried in fake pictures. You'll never find them. So that strategy is extremely, extremely potent to bury a, a, a real damning testimony around a bunch of fake, funny testimonies. And what you get is people just laugh at it. And that's where that's where we're at with all of it. And my testimony is the same thing. Yeah. So uh, Theories Colony Cavalier is a testimony of the secret space program. The elites that do these satanic ritual um, sacrifices and other things. And they're, they're rituals that they were communicating with entities and um, ETs through satanic ritual. That's all part of it. So it's all things I witnessed and it's like a day at the office for them. Uh, there was another part of that that you touched on. Um, that I'm forgetting right now. Like that was a big answer. It's exhausting. That was. Can we move on? What does your time frame look like? I got a little bit of time left. Uh, okay. I got another twenty minutes. I just want to show you some pictures, and then I is it? May I ask you a little bit about your time at series? Sure, you can ask me anything, Brandy. Like you're personally, like I want to ask you some personal questions about your time at series. Um, I know that. I know that you fell in love. What can we talk about that? Sure. Okay. So I know you fell in love while you were at series and not only were you, so you were, when you got to series, you explained the civilization that was there and under the surface. Can you talk, tell us a little bit about that group of people and who's under the series? Who is under the surface? Like who is they that? Were Europeans, they were Deutsch, okay. Deutsch Europeans, so Germans and um, probably Polish people. They didn't consider themselves Germans; they considered themselves Deutsch. Deutsch. So I don't know the history of that, how that works. They were very proud of the Thirty Years' War in the 1600s, and they were living inside. There are massive caverns inside series, the planetoid series. They go on for miles and miles. Then they had giant areas where they set up cities, and they had all they had artificial gravity flooring so that it was one g in there like there's microgravity and there were places you weren't allowed to go um there were places you weren't allowed to go into the microgravity so they had it there were places that you could see where there would be microgravity and throw things in it but uh you weren't allowed to go in it people there it, people died in it um but they were deutsch and they were they were had moved there they the colonies they moved in and started building european types towns and and structures lots of columns and lots of homes and apartments up the side of the wall um, and into caverns and they were it's funny because the more we hear about smart cities it's like that's the more of the lifestyle there you didn't get a car there were no cars only the the police and the fire department had vehicles they um and in the hangar they had you know emergency response vehicles but there were trains for everybody you were never more than a 15 minute walk from a train station and you could go anywhere inside the inside the planet on the inside all the towns that were spread out through it uh, in about 45 light, minutes. Did light shine anywhere there? Light. Yeah, well, they had a, they had like it would dim at night and then it looked a lot like Vegas. Like they had a lot of places had a fake blue sky painted on the ceiling and with and they'd shine a light on it. So it looked like it was lit up. But. For the most part, it wasn't very bright. There were places that were bright. The school area had the lights on 24-7. It was always daytime when you went to the uh, academy. You know, they had a school um, area. The school that you certified. trained in? Well, I would go there to get certified for new stuff for my job. So whenever there was something changed on my software, I had to go take a class. 
and I would go there for a few, you know, a few five or six days and then go back to work and then months later go again. So, but that, what I'm saying is that particular area, the, the light was bright out in the hallway and it was always on. It never had a fake night. It was always daytime when you got there. Mm -hmm. Um, but other places in the main, in the main caverns, like in the shopping areas and there was a red light district that was usually dark, even in the day, like it didn't have a daytime. It had an, it had perpetual evening. Um, but there were places where the, the lights would come on and you knew it was fake. You know, there were many places you couldn't see the, the ceiling. You couldn't see the roof of the cave of the cavern and they shine the lights on the walls and you just couldn't see up there. So um, can I talk to you a little bit about this red district? Let's not tell the story of how you got there. Let's let people read the book because the okay. your adventure of actually getting into how you first got into the club is really interesting and fascinating. And, and by that, I mean, Tony encounters like a fish like being and a cat like being. So he isn't seeing other species beyond humanoids and grays. Super cool story. You guys have to read that book to catch that. I think maybe he talks about it in other interviews, but I would love to know what it was like inside the, the club. So, so you made friends here, correct? So yeah. there was an area, so there was an ET, they, there was a, they were like nine feet, nine footers and they had big elongated heads and hair. He had curly hair and really small beady eyes and a human looking face. And, but he was big, he had wide hips. They were, they were strange looking and they ran most of the businesses, like the restaurants, there'd always be one of them managing it. And uh, he was in a low gravity area. He had a booth, like his, his, imagine a strip club with a stage with a, girls dancing and then a bar recessed in the floor like an old style like a cheers looking bar a european style bar and then booths you know around and in the corner the owner or the person that, the et that was managing it we called we nicknamed him crumb he went by crumbs mm -hmm. uh he was in a low gravity area his booth where he could see everywhere in the place and he had his you know he did cash he, he had his equipment there and it was a lower gravity area so he didn't want to leave there was one table in the corner by the door. When you came in the door, there was a row of tables there where people sat. And there was one table he couldn't see. He just couldn't put eyes on it. And a girl got assaulted in there before I ever got in there. And I, he, he whatever, you know, like you said, it's in the book. So I went back, I owed him money. I went back and paid him his money. And I asked him if I could stay because if I went back, they put me to work. I was basically slave labor. So if I had nothing to do, they'd find something for me to do. Were you so, wearing something on your neck the entire time at series? If I was in public, no, only in public. When I went okay. home, when I went to bed, they'd take it off. Okay. Um, but I had a collar that identified me and it could shock me. It was a shock collar. Mm -hmm. So oddly enough, um, he said I could, I was welcome to stay and have water and stay in that table until the club filled up. He said, so once it filled up with people, I had to leave. And that only happened a few times. But I would that way I was a placeholder. Nobody would sit in that table and he could see everybody else where all the girls were. So that was his that was his reasoning for me being there. And they they trusted me. And so I did. I spent time there. And then, you know, I was I was uh, you know in my mid to late twenties at the time and slave labor. I, I was a cargo engineer on a spaceship and we would leave it, like I said, we'd leave at eight in the morning and we'd get back at eight in the morning. So I had all those extra hours to go while the guys were at the mines. If I went back to the barracks, you know, where I stayed, they would make me do laundry or sweep or mop or something. So I always wanted to be around, be somewhere else. And I could just go there and kill time. And it, it was during the day, I'd go there in the morning and it would be dead. So there was only, you know, there were three girls. There was always three girls on duty minimum. And so they would come and they would come and sit with me and we'd talk and they would do their round. They had to get up after three songs or five, four songs. They'd always have to make a round. If there was nobody there, they'd walk around and come back and sit down. We'd all just sat and talked. I was a slave too. What did you and, talk uh, about? You know, they always wanted to know where I went. Where'd you go? Did you see the sunlight? They really were, they were really, you know, especially who I named Marie in the book. It's not a real name. Um, she was really, she was really upset about never seeing the sunlight. She was big on the sun. Like it really, it really hurt her. And so she always wanted to hear about, you know, did you go anywhere? Was it, was the sun out? And I was like, no, we were there. It was nighttime. Most of the time 
when we snuck into another planet, we'd come in at night. Um, but she would ask me about where I was and what it was like. Was it warm? And, you know, what'd you do? She asked me about my day and I'd ask her about her day. I had like, oddly enough, like sexual questions, you know, like I wanted yeah, to know they, they had, these, they had, uh, they had extraterrestrials coming in there yeah. and it was a, it was like a strip club that, you know, was a brothel as well. So I don't know if, I don't know, I've never been to the, any of the red light districts on earth and I don't know if it was the same or not, but basically the girls would go around and mingle. They would go up every so often on stage and have to dance. They were required to this and they would entertain guests and they were available for purchase to go into the back and have sex with. And uh, so I would always ask what their life was like, you know, and they arranged one day to just give me a freebie and I went back and had sex with her and we fell madly in love with together. We were, we were very much, we were very much in love with each other at the time. And uh, that was my life. So that was for me, for me being a slave and going through everything I went through in the book up to that point was a huge victory, was a huge achievement to, you know what I mean? To have somebody love me and to be in love. So that was that's why the book is named that because I got in trouble for acting cavalier because I started to have confidence and I wasn't supposed to. And so that's why the book is serious colony cavalier. That was me for, that was the pep in my step when I was in walk in love. And I started acting like that at work and um, it stood out. So they punished me for it, but she was there. And then at the very end, I, you know, um, never really got to say goodbye, but that's a whole nother story. I also think that that was the main motivator for getting my memories back. I think that was the main thing. I did not want to forget her. Like, you know, relationships have a curve and the curve might last a weekend. It might last your whole life. It's the same thing. There's, you meet somebody, you're sort of interested. You get to know them better. There's a peak, you fall in love. You realize you love each other. And then it has this passionate crescendo. And then, it, you know, you deal with it and you live your life out. There's a curve and then it ends. So all relationships are going to end. Um, be it, be it by death or splitting up our relationship at the time when I had to leave series, when my 20 years was up was at that very top of that curve. And so it was like very intense and it was cut short. And so because of that, I didn't want to forget her and I didn't want to, um, you know, I wanted to remember, I wanted my memories back. I kept telling myself, I'm going to remember, I'm going to remember. Like it motivated me. I knew that they were going to put me back and erase my memories. And, um, I didn't want to. I wanted to remember her. So that was like a big motivator thing. You know, I don't know how many lonely guys you've ever met anybody watching this, but, you know, love is a powerful motivator. Um, a pretty girl can motivate a man to do a lot of incredible things. <clears throat> Have you encountered her at all? I know that you mentioned, does she know? Have you had any interaction? And I can cut this out if you don't even want to breach the subject. But have you... Do you want to yeah. talk about this or not? So, yeah, to be fair, so to be fair, um, I did find her. I, you know, there for a while on a monthly basis, girls would, different girls would email me and say, it's me. Don't you remember me? I'm Marie from the book. It's, it's me. And I'm thinking, and a lot of them never even gave me a picture. It's like, how am I supposed to remember you? Like, it was really weird. Um, but it was a phenomenon where a lot of girls remembered that they were her. Um, but they weren't. And I did find her. Um, there's a real phenomenon there for people that fall in love in the, in these 20 and backs that find each other. Uh, I'm not the only one. There's a, it's a common theme. Um, but she was very happily married with a beautiful family. And I told her everything over a period of time and she entertained the idea. And when she began to get her own memories back and it became real at first, she was, Oh, that's funny. You know, Tony, you're a great guy, but you know, it's kind of far-fetched. But after a, a month or two of me telling her literally everything I remembered and being completely candid and open, uh, she began to have dreams and remember snippets. And we quit talking. And I think it was a real disservice to her um, because when it became real to to think about being a sex worker for 20 years with ETs and living through horrible things uh, really destroyed her self-perception. And it was a disservice for me to, to force that on her. So that's why I just leave it like that. So we don't speak. It's been years. Well, Tony, it's okay. You That wasn't your intention. You know, we're here no. waking and exploring. And what else are you going to do but reach out and connect and express yourself? 
So that's okay. I hope that you don't hold any guilt or anything for how it affected her, you know? Well, I mean, well, I learned a lesson. So if you, uh, just because you use totally, the word disservice, it is a disservice to somebody. It's, it's, it's very disturbing to hear about some people that are doing these tarot psychic readings and they're telling people you were a super soldier yeah, and you were in the programs and it's a complete disservice to somebody. If they, if they need to know, they'll remember it on their own and no one can tell you that you were anything. And there's, it's, well, they, again, it's probably a disinfo uh, situation. They're cranking out a bunch of false witnesses to bury the real witnesses under under testimony so a lot of the hypnosis sessions are front-loading data and telling people you know mm -hmm. tell us about your time in the secret space program while they're under hypnosis and then they come out believing it it's like it's a mess out there right now there's a lot of fake um fakely falsely influenced witness witnesses in the world and so it's just another attempt to bury it that's like we said with earlier like we said with anything else uh, it's a very effective strategy um are you open to, uh, let me ask you something just really quick. Did you know and remember your time on earth? I remember that while on Mars and you had the interaction with the mantis being from that time on, did you hold the memory of your time on earth or was it only just kind of in that incident where you remembered or when I was in Peru, I was a kid. My first stop, I was 10 years old, 11 and 12, you know, till 12. Uh, in Peru when I was doing the psychic service and they gave me I had a black and white tv but it wasn't always on it it was only on a few hours a day um, they gave me crayons and paper to draw on you know I was a 10 year old kid 11 year old kid and bored and I always drew the same thing I drew my farmhouse in my long driveway that I was taken from and I had no idea I had no idea uh, why they would ask, why do you always draw the same thing? He only draw, I only ever drew a farmhouse with a long driveway every time. That uh, Every doodle I ever did during that for year for those years with crayons was over and over and over and over again. It was a farmhouse and a long driveway. And the house I was taken from, our driveway was like a quarter mile long to the mailbox. We had a long, like a long 13 acre lot. And um, I was drawing that house subconsciously, but I did not have memory of it. And then later on in the Mars thing with the insectoid, it showed me the living room of the house. I could smell it. And um, I had no idea where I was. I didn't I didn't have any memory of it. So the whole time. Do you want to look at some pictures right now to see? I have pulled up some pictures from Elena's book. She okay. in her book, A Gift from Stars, outlines several different species of greys. And so I've pulled out some images that are from star systems that are found in your charts, in your birth charts. Okay. Do you want to look at them? And so I thought maybe yeah, this is a, oh, first of all, Tony, thank you so much for just sharing all of that. Um, It's such a blessing to have your testimony and have it come from someone such as yourself, because it enables us, I think, to perceive these as reality, whereas before due to media or like what you were saying, people may, being made fun of, I just really appreciate you for, for sharing and, and talking about this. I am going to share screen here. See this? Yeah. Yes. So to the left here, we have your chart. Um, and so the there's a lot here, Tony. I actually will. Wow. I'd like to create. Um, I would like to do a reading for you totally off camera. I'll record it and send it to you. You can watch it at your own leisure. There's so much in your charts on a personal note that I would love to share with you. During this part, Tony and I go over his fixed star alignments and compare them to the species that he encountered. That said, I loved his overall opinion about all this research into the grays that he encountered. Take a listen. Does Do any of those look familiar at all? So not so much these guys, but the other ones do, the other grays. This one? Like that, yeah, him especially... 
Like I think he's more like the teacher I had on Mars. And then that one looks like I might have seen them around the, on the moon. Okay. You know what, though? You get to the point where, I mean, it kind of. I remember distinctly when I was up there that I didn't care about them. You know what I'm saying? Like, you think, like, what is the name and where are they from and what do they do? All that, like, the the limited access I had, they were, it was, it's kind of like you're either human or you're not. Yeah. And so, um, plus, I don't have a lot of memory of the names. It's like, it's hard for me to remember street names or business names or names of the, all the planets we went to, we had numbers. We didn't, we didn't say we're going to Antares. We said we're going to gs one fourteen thirty eight dash you know like we had they had numbers on addresses where we went everywhere so most of the star systems we went to were out of the range of the naked eye uh, of in the night sky so we went to we didn't go nearby earth most of the time um but that was one of those things like um it sounds like an excuse but it's the truth that uh you know when somebody tells you your, a story of their life and they tell you like yeah i was i grew up on, on such, such and such street such and such and you listen to it and you're listening for their emotional you know like what was it like there you had nice weather and everything and then you see them a month later you have no idea what street they were on and it was kind of like that with the ets with me um just because i never had any kind of say in when or how i would interact with them i wasn't allowed to interact with them and so when I did, I didn't have any kind of say about it. So I was just kind of like it being operated on kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. To explain, but those guys do look familiar. It's, but the Mitra one looks very familiar. Like that was somebody that was both on the moon and Mars and the other one too. But it's hard to put it in context. The other thing is there are so many different kinds. There are a dime a dozen. You're not going to remember all the kinds of ET, of gray ETs yeah. or billions. So it's kind of like an unachievable thing to even care about. Um, yeah, that makes sense. I'm trying to put I'm trying to put it in context, but it was like I I see this Elena's work with all the names. There's the Soviet book of of, and some of them I look through and I go, yeah, that looks really familiar, and I can't really put my head mind on it, you know, yeah. because by and large, I I it was something that was not up to me. Um, like a lot of, like everybody drives cars, they don't care about how it works, and so. I had to deal with ETs, but I didn't really care where they were from at the time. Some of them I would ask, yeah. um, where are you from? And what's it like? I wanted to know more about what I know that the vastness of space, it's not like you're going to get directions and ask them where they're from and say, where is that by? Because they're going to give you another answer that you don't know. So it's like worrying about the location in a conversation with an ET of where they're from is futile um, unless it's very close. And most of the time it's not. They have a base close by. But um, I would always ask them, what's it like? How's your gravity? What's the weather like? What do you guys eat? Like, that's the kind of stuff that I remember what, caring about. Like, tell me what your home, what your world looks like. Is it, is it blue? Is it red? And um, and you had this convert, you had a, a, a conversation similar to some one of the beings that was working on you in the moon. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I had a reptilian that was my yeah. chaperone. He was security. So he was a strong reptilian. He did not look like those. Okay. So it, he had a different face for sure. He had a different, like a, like he had a strange, this area was strange looking. And he was a, he was a reptilian. He had scales. Um, But he was a neat guy. He had a sense of humor and uh, it was like hanging out. I was a young kid hanging out with a 20 year old guy. Like it was that kind of humor that we had back and forth. And uh, he was just, I realized that he was a person just like me. That the ETs are ultimately people, you know, that with different different cultures. Like, it's going to be eye opening once we finally get a disclosure and we see what what they're really like up there. You what know, do you are... think that's going to look like? What do you think? What do you think that's going to look like? I know that we've talked about it a little bit um, in your in tier in in the Patreon groups, but what do you foresee this like disclosure? Like, how do you think it's going to work? I think they're, we're going to have missions. That, okay, so there may be a catastrophe that kicks off these arcs that um, some of the whistleblowers are talking about. And uh, we get a bunch of giant um, spaceships floating over all the cities in the world. That there's going to be some kind of catastrophe. 
Um, there may be a moon mission that discovers a, a monument or something on the moon or a mission to Mars that discovers something and then the ETs come in and introduce themselves. It's it's going to be something like that. I, I don't think we're going to get a global catastrophe where the whole world is going to be you know, purged and then it starts over. Like, I don't think we're going to get a great flood or something, but we are going to get some some sort of catastrophic interruption. And I'm actually starting to think on the terms of um, once there's a disclosure, there's no going back. Like we're in a blissfully ignorant time in the world right now. And so once there is a disclosure, we're never we're going back to what, how we are. We're going to we're going to understand that we are in a place in the universe with a lot of other things or with that. It's the wild west up there. I just want to tell you, thank you so much for bringing your story to people. It's really, really benefit. And I appreciate you as a human being and you're a beautiful man. And thank you for everything that you're doing. And I can't wait to hear and read your next book. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I hope we get to meet too sometime. So Brandy, it's um, thanks for this. And the book report thing, you did a great job. I mean, it's amazing what you did. Your show with book reports is going to be, is actually very sorely needed in the world on YouTube in the world. So there's a lot of books coming out. It'd be great if you did what you're doing for me for all of them. Yeah, uh, I plan on great. it and some podcasts too. There's yeah. a couple of content creators. I want to do something similar. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I hope you have a beautiful day. You too, Brandy. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Love you. Bye. Bye.